Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm Ross Gallagher, Ventures Lead here at 11FS. In today's episode, we're back again talking about how not to build a bank. At 11FS, we've launched products in different markets, continents, economic conditions right across the globe, but we do often see many of the same challenges popping up again and again. So we're giving our experts the Tony Soprano treatment and inviting them to the podcasting therapy couch to share the biggest hurdles to overcome when launching a product into the world. Uh, This is the second part of a two-episode discussion, so if you haven't listened to last week's episode, uh, do go check that out first. Last time, we focused on spinning up a product, and today we're looking at that all-important launch. We've put together an all-star panel of 11s to discuss What are the biggest challenges before the launch date? Is the launch the end of the journey? And why are all the difficult days worth it in the end? We will discuss all of this and more in today's show, but first, a few brief messages, so please don't go anywhere. 11FS has been voted Consultancy of the Year at the British Bank Awards for a fourth time. We are super excited about bringing home the trophy, and it means more knowing that it is our clients that are the ones who voted for us. Digital financial services may only be 1% finished, but we're working with banks, fintechs, and everybody in between to chip away at the 99% still to go. And moments like this really tell us that we're on the right track. If you want to work with an award-winning team to build game-changing propositions, then let's chat. 11FS Ventures is home to industry experts across embedded finance, customer experience, digital strategy, bank building, and so much more. Kickstart your next project today and visit 11FS.com forward slash ventures. That's 11FS.com forward slash ventures. A lot of you know 11FS for our chart-topping podcasts, our events, videos, reports, and a bunch of other cool stuff that we do. But what a lot of you don't know is that this is just all our side hustle. We do so much more than that. At 11FS Ventures, we're partnering with ambitious businesses around the world to design, build, and launch truly digital financial services. We are building banks, shaping new propositions, and growing existing offerings that change the fabric of financial services. And our design, research, strategy, strategy and engineering experts are working to improve your customer's relationship with money. To find out a little bit more, check us out at 11fs.com forward slash ventures. Okay, let's get started. So as mentioned, I'm joined by a panel of 11FS All-Stars who are here to show off their battle scars. Um, First, we have David Greer, our group CEO here at 11FS. David, as ever, great to have you. Maybe you can just give us uh, a little bit on like, what is an 11FS? Yeah, uh, great to be on. Uh, Joe, I was a bit worried about the Tony Soprano treatment we were going to get at the beginning of that. I was, uh, spoiler alert, it doesn't end particularly well, does it? But uh, uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it was just the therapy part of that in that sense. But uh, uh, what is an 11FS? Do you know what? I did a speaking thing yesterday for a big bank in the UK, and I basically said that 11FS is personal trainers to help you get fit. Um, we don't do the press-ups and the sit-ups for you. We, uh, we help you get fighting fit as an organization, and whether that's understanding what your customers' problems really are or whether it's actually taking a great idea and executing it into the market it's all about making it happen you're never short of a great analogy and uh super helpful i'll be honest describing what we do i'll be honest i just get bored of saying the same thing so i just got to keep coming up with new ones yeah that's fair all right great uh great to have you david um we also have uh ewan silver our group cto at 11fs uh ewan welcome great to have you as well um what do you do in the the bank building process i guess well, at least I'm not a personal trainer like in David's new uh, fitness club he's running here. <laughs> um, so, so my job is to run all the engineering teams, uh, basically take all the ideas that the product and strategy and research guys like Kate and so on and so forth come up with, uh, and then actually turn it into reality. Nice. You make it happen. Hopefully. Excellent. All right. Uh, also joining us, uh, Kate Moody, our customer strategy director at 11FS. Uh, hey, Kate. Kate, how does a, a customer strategy director help build banks? Well, yeah, I don't do any of the building just to avoid panicking anyone. I definitely leave that to, to you. And but my role, you know, at the very beginning and all the way through into this um, ramp up to launch is just really helping to continue to stay 
truly focused on that that customer pain that you're looking to solve, those those key jobs to be done, working out how those insights translate through from that initial product idea through into the execution into market, you know, how are you going to communicate what you're doing? What does the next phase of your roadmap look like? How are you going to build that initial community that helps you to continue to gather feedback from your customers as you go out to market? So basically anything to do with being nosy about people, I'm all over it. Love it. All right. And then last but not least, we've got Naz Ahmed, uh, our 11FS general counsel. Although, Naz, like so much more, right? I butchered your job title last time, so I'm I'm not going to do it again this time. That's all right. General counsel and I also uh, run the delivery function uh, in Ventures Our Consulting Arm. Awesome. Uh, and I do push-ups and sit-ups for no one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pay money to see that, Naz. <laughs> it's good to know where we stand right before we dive in. So those kind of boundaries I, I find super helpful. So awesome. All right, look, part two, thank you all for joining again. Um I'm looking forward to diving in. So uh let's 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 do just that. Let's open it up to the floor, let's discuss those days, building up to uh getting a product live in the market. And look, David, I mean you've done this. A handful of times, right? Uh, do you want to share some of those some of those traumas? What are what are some of the biggest hurdles? Yeah, it's a weird one. I mean, it's particularly when you're working in an agile way, then actually deadlines and dates are, are reasonably sort of, uh, you know, ethereal. But actually, you've always got to kind of bring about a, a certain level of certainty. Are, are you ever really ready to go live? Uh, I don't think you really ever are. But actually, that's actually part of the process. You know, a bit, we're really big believers in, you know, getting to market quickly, testing things with customers, making sure that they really care about what you're doing. And and actually a big part of that is is getting out there and talking to people and, and moving it forward. So so there's never really a moment where you feel like everything is done and therefore you're you're really, really, really ready to go. But you've got to be as ready as you can be. Um and actually if I'm honest, managing that that transition between the, you know, the um you know, the craziness of of building and running a startup uh, particularly in a big banking organization, the certainty and the sort of project approaches that are, are usually, you know, waterfall has an ending, but agile does not, right? So, uh, you know, being in a situation where you can create enough structure and, and comfort in people to to get them through the next stage gate that you need them to get to while protecting the team from all of the, you know, the inertia that comes with that. I mean, is a real is a real skill set. I mean, Naz, me and you've been in the trenches on this one a lot, right? So, uh, uh, how do you build a governance process that actually allows people to do those things is a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, proportionality is still a key word. You know, the word launch is a very loaded phrase because it implies, uh, to quote someone off air, a big red button that someone pushes. Uh, whereas often what one actually means is a pilot or an alpha or a beta or something where you're testing before you scale in a controlled manner, which already sounds much more reasonable and less scary. And I think that is what allows proportionality because when your volumes are low, you can say, here's my framework here, so I'm going to do the basics, but the rest are wait and see how it goes based on feedback, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but obviously, when you're at greater scale, that is um, uh, less permissible. Yeah, no, I think it's. I think that's useful, useful context, right? Because launch means different things to different people, right? Now, but we're not talking about like straight off the bat this big bang going live to like millions of people. We're talking about doing this in a really controlled way. I guess one of the obvious hurdles, now, kind of sticking with you, that you're going to come up against there is like facing back into especially if you're doing this as a sort of big organization you're doing you're doing something new you're trying to bring something new to market facing back into those sort of internal risk and control functions taking them on the journey like how how does that process typically play out sure i mean i think i think by the time you're you're launching whatever scale you know really they will have been on the journey for a long time already and know what you're going to do um i think to, to your point and david's point about kind of governance and, and the implication that, you know, how do you risk, how do you avoid being stifled? Really, I think it's being clear on what you're going to do and how far you're going to go before you come back and get your next backs of permission or latitude. Uh, and then and then sticking to those uh, milestones or those gateposts. And again, you know, 
particularly at lower volumes, if you're willing to think positively or innovatively, there are lots of ways to um, mitigate risk, even if you're a bit um, rough and readier in other areas. The level of contact you can have with customers, your ability to make good any losses they may have, given you're talking relatively small volumes, um, your ability to do kind of post-sale checks or personalised onboarding, et cetera, et cetera, uh, really is is actually much higher than you'll ever enjoy in a BAU environment. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Most, you know, projects in a bank, you know, the live bit is the end bit. But the reality really is, is when you're building a business, that's the bit that everything actually starts. You know, the, you know, the first time you sort of let some customers into the systems you've been building, you know, you really get to understand actually, you know, whether what you thought they would do and the way in which you thought they would behave, they really do or not. And that's, uh, it is an amazing feeling. It's nice to, um, you know, stand back and, uh, you know, pop a cork and, uh, and have a, have a drink and, and, and sort of celebrate the successes of just even getting to that point. But, but really the, the journey begins from there. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's such, it's such a nice milestone, right? Because something that you've sort of, you've, you've worked on tirelessly, right? You might've designed up from a blank sheet of paper is now in market. And of course that's a, that's a really cool time to stop and, and pat yourself on the back. Kate, I'm curious, we talked sort of, Naz talked a little bit about what are some of those things that you need to check off sort of internally, right? With those risk and control functions, all that sort of stuff to make sure that you're ready to go um, from a, a sort of launch perspective. I, is there a moment, is there ever a moment, have you had a moment where you actually feel from talking to customers, actually, I feel like we're sort of ready to go here? Or is it always iterative? Is it always a bit of a leap of faith? I think you can definitely get to a stage in, in testing where you're just hearing consistently like the same reactions to something, like the kind of core essence of that initial version of your product multiple times. Like, you know, sometimes you get into conversations with, you know, um, people are partnering with about like, how many interviews should we do? How many? And, and in some ways, like you just kind of want to start. And then as soon as you start to just hear the same things over and over again, you, that kind of tells you that you're, you've hit on something or the, the, either you've hit on the right thing or you've hit on the wrong thing. <laughs> if they're all saying the same bad things, hopefully not. Um, but yeah, it's 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 always, I think, as we've alluded to, it's this is definitely like the start of a process. And I think the thing that's almost most fascinating about this phase is you probably have good feedback from your customers on that initial product or that initial MVP. But it's really when you get out into that bigger launch that you start to see some of the like unexpected ways that customers interact with your product or some of the unexpected kind of groups of customers that are attracted to your product because of the, the messaging that you've taken to market or the feedback that they've had from their friends. And that can um, be a really, really interesting time. That kind of really starts to shine a light on your ability as a team to kind of take that feedback on board, to kind of run those analytics, and then to kind of have a view of, okay, well, this is a core vision that we have for the evolution of the product that we want to have, but there's like this additional information here, all these additional customers that we could go after. How do we balance that? How do we you know, bring these new customers with us about losing that kind of that future trajectory that we want to get to over multiple phases of product development? So, yeah, I think this is a, a super interesting time and one where you know, it's still critical to continue speaking to customers, but definitely not a one and done. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a super interesting point because, I mean, obviously in this process, you know, when you go through jobs to be done, when you look at the the ways in which you can solve those for customers, you come up with a a huge list. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're not just creating a list of uh, the things you're going to do for launch, but you're creating the list of things that you can do to solve all of these, uh, you know, needs, the jobs from, from a customer's perspective. Often when you put something live and solve a problem that's not been solved for somebody before, very often the next one crops up really quickly, doesn't it? So you, yeah. you almost create another problem that the customer didn't have because they've never actually been able to get to that that stage yet, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's the dream, right? That you're kind of your product is taking away friction from people's financial lives that enables them to kind of start to do things that they either just didn't have the, the mental bandwidth or the actual practical understanding or the actual financial resources to do before. So yeah, ideally if you're helping your customers to achieve things and that just unlocks more things for them to go and do kind of like, you know, like I'm playing a lot of Legend of Zelda at the moment outside of work hours and it's just kind of like you complete one shrine and then you're on to the next one. It's kind of just an on ongoing thing, a never ending world of joy. Well, a little advert there for Nintendo in the middle. I like that. Oh yeah, sorry. It really, um, it really serves to sort of um, <clears throat> ram home that point though, right? That like launch isn't it, you know, and it, it's so interesting what you're saying about you unlock, 
user's ability to be able to do one thing, but then they're straight on to the next thing. They're like, oh, that's interesting. I've got that now. Maybe I can do this. Um, so I suppose just sort of re- really reinforces that sort of continually iterative uh, development point. Um, you and what are what are some of those? Uh, what, what are the, the the tech and engineering teams going to be focusing on in the sort of the build up build up to launch? What's their uh, where's their attention going to be? Well, I guess the thread, if we listen to what everyone's been talking about, is you know you're into iteration, right? You're into growing this system out. You're into trying to find you know new problems and understand and get the hypotheses validated and so on and so forth. So I think from an engineering perspective, probably the key things that you want to be able to do is you want to have an infrastructure and a capability that allows you to roll code out on a regular basis. You know, just making sure those pipelines and those build processes and so on and so forth are are working properly because that allows you to grow this system out. Uh, it allows you to get to a place where, you know, you've got all your, your basic monitoring and metric in, 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 in there. You've got all your, you know, your, your testing uh all the infrastructure is up and running, everything's green. You get it live, as Naz kind of alluded to, you're not going to go live with a large number of people. It is going to be friends and family. You are going to be validating hypotheses. So the scale on on this is not massive. Uh, you are then going to see different changes of behavior, you know, as, as Kate sort of alluded to. People will they'll either love the stuff you're doing, they'll hate it, or they may well just love a, a different feature. And so the question then becomes, right, how do you start moving in that direction? And the underlying capability is just that ability to roll code out, roll changes out on a regular basis and grow this system out. That's, that's the primary focus. And that, I think that is almost the most critical thing across everything. You know, because actually, uh, again, I was, I was having a conversation with an organization yesterday, and actually the difference that that makes in your attitude to risk, you know, now as I'm sure you'll uh, you know, have more to say on that in a, in a second, but your, your approach to strategy, you know, strategy doesn't become a six-month thing. It becomes a, you know, a, a, you know a six days of, of investigation, you know, and then actually you're doing it. You're not just talking about doing it. You're, you've actually got the ability to make changes happen and move things forward rapidly because I think that's the, that's the critical. If we were to boil down the secret to success of any of the fintech players that have come into the market and done really well, it is their ability to go from, idea to execution cost effectively and quickly and actually you know starting with those foundations being built in in anything that we're building if i'm honest with you is more important than actually the learnings that they get from customer sorry kate or or the even the amount of customers that they acquire um if those big organizations can learn how to do change like a small organization fundamentally that's the infection that they need to catch I mean, your launch should not be a big bang. It should be a small whimper. And it should be lots lots and lots of small whimpers. I mean, with, with balloons and champagne, but oh, yeah. I do agree, yeah. No, I was going to say, you know, I think launch is not the issue. It's, uh, it's scaling. But I think to some of the points that have been made earlier, it's, it's really being comfortable with essentially continually juggling two plates. So one is you know, servicing the customers you've got to run in your pilot. But the second one is constantly planning for the next phase of expansion, product development, operational sophistication. So you have, uh, you know, this strange world where you're running your pilot and your customer operation, but you're continually thinking of the beta phase or uh, the 5,000 launch or the 15,000 launch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Just, I think one other thing to emphasize about about launch is you know you should be very clear that shit will go wrong and you should almost i would argue embrace the fact that shit goes wrong because i'd rather hap- have that happen at 500 or 5000 customers in 50 or 150000 um uh but it can you know it's very easy to say that but when it actually happens it can be very disconcerting uh, and disheartening and worrying to stakeholders so um, just something to be aware of and then actually uh, embrace obviously within limits it can't continue to go wrong all the time um, but you know that's just a really important point to emphasize because once you do launch like it it does feel much more real so at the risk of stating the obvious yeah and I mean you know we're talking I guess about having those sort of like those those fundamentals right in place from a, a sort of core perspective but you and how how much of uh, I guess some of the, some of the other stuff is just going to be sort of hacked together on the back end, right? Like um, categorizing um, 
transactions sort of manually, but the 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 customer the customer doesn't necessarily know that it's manual, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some things that you can hack together, as you said, and some stuff that you cannot hack together. So, you know, low level payment flows, money storage, absolutely no chance can be taken with that at all in any way, shape or form. But the higher level services, the things that actually, you know, validate the jobs to be done that Kate and the team are focusing on, you know, often because you don't know what those what those outcomes are going to be, you don't actually know how customer behavior is going to work. You, you want to do something very lightweight. You know, uh, you can do, weirdly, putting it into code may not be the best idea. Multiple times we've seen people succeed very, very well by by having manual back end. Something will come in. You'll have a front end. Uh, I don't know a categorization capability. Actually, it may well be a human doing it on the back end for the first ten, twenty, thirty customers, because uh, you can actually adapt it very quickly. And you can see people go, "Oh my god, that's amazing!" You know, or you know, "Wow, I can't believe they do that." Once you get those light bulb moments, that's when I guess Kate and the product teams then click in and go, "Right, this is what we need to double down on." So uh, I think don't try it. You know, the, the errors where I think we've seen a lot of people do is they, they try and put in a system that works for 100,000 plus people. You're, you're, not, you're not near that. You don't know what even the requirements are going to be. So being able to validate it with manual capabilities, humans behind the scenes, or even, you know, some small startup that actually does something very quickly and cheaply is what you want to do. It's, it's, it's throwaway code, but it's not throwaway learning. Yeah, no, super interesting. I mean, Kate, look, keen to get your uh, your sort of reaction to that, your thoughts on that as well. And then another thing that I'm keen to get your thoughts on is uh, picking a name. How, how how do you do that? How does that happen? Yeah, no, I think I absolutely agree with everything that sort of Dave and Yonaz have talked about. So there are there are a couple of exceptions. Like I think about um, some of the work you with Trustbank in Singapore, for example, they were launching and they did do an initial sort of smaller launch, but then they knew quite soon afterwards they were going to be scaling out to you know, thousands of thousands of users of an established product. So I think when there's a sort of migration element involved, then it becomes, becomes slightly different. But I think otherwise, apart from that, I'm, I'm completely in agreement. Um, in terms of the naming thing, I am absolutely not a like a brand naming consultant or anything like that. But we have tons of conversations about this with our clients, both in those kind of early stages when we're we have just those very low fidelity initial concepts and ideas because we want to put something out in front of customers and that has to have a name for it to feel real. Um, and also, as you go through into those later stages, you're actually thinking about what is the thing that's going to exist in the real world. Um, and people do get very excited about it. Um, people love to sit around a table, like having a chat for ages. Like, what about this? Or what about this? Or what about that? Um, I mean, I remember like hearing you, David and Jason, kind of talking about any organizations you've named in the past. It feels like it really comes down to just trying to make a decision um, and to do that based on sort of a, a small number of criteria that are important to to what it is you're launching. Um, you know, key ones are obviously, you know, about you know, is it something that is vaguely easy to say and pronounce, you know, not sort of 55 syllables? Is it something that you, in the world of digital, that you can get you know, digital properties for? Um, is it something it's not going to be offensive? Um and it's depending on, yeah, with the kind of context you think people are going to be talking about it in, you know, are people going to be, I guess the dream is for people to say like Monzo me this or Google that and you want it to become the, ad, the adjective. But um, I also think it's super interesting to see how companies evolve. So we've seen transfer wise become wise. I think there's definitely a logic to picking a name in that early stage that makes a connection to what it is you precisely do in that first iteration of your product, very tangible and easy for customers just to get, you know, oh, it's transfer-wise, oh, they help me to transfer money. Okay, great, I get it. But as you evolve and as your offering broadens, you, you can change your name as well. Like, you know, it's it's you're not it's not set in stone forever necessarily. It's not easy to do, but you can pivot and adjust as well. But David, I'd love to get your take. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with, with what you said about uh, good names for things. In, in the same way as, you know, in the last episode, we talked about the, you know, what's that 60 second, 90 second strap line for it. You don't create those through committee. You don't have, you know, 30 people in it. I mean, Kate, we've sat in a few where it's like, uh, you know, 30 people in a room, let's come up with the strap line for it. And it's like, okay, that doesn't work. Like everybody suddenly has a, a word in this sentence and this sentence makes no <laughs> sense, right? So so actually being in a situation where you're forceful with those things, I think is really important. You know, absolutely, you've got to kind of have a good feel for, for it. It's not going to have, as you say, any sort of negative connotations. And, you know, being able to buy a domain is always really, really helpful. But I mean, I, I'm a big believer that actually the ones that really stand the test of time 
uh, have more of a deep meaning connected to the thing that they're actually trying to achieve, uh, or at least a good story. I mean, like uh, the amount of times I get asked about why do we call 11FS 11FS, but but I, I mean, if you look at metal, you know, you know, when we were building metal, the the grit and determination that is required to be an entrepreneur, the word metal fits really nicely. And and with Mox, I mean, to to be Moxie in Hong Kong is to be uh, financially savvy. So it, it fits really nice with what you're doing. And actually, I mean, that for me kind of comes back to both in the short term and in the long term. It's kind of getting everybody to believe in the thing and it to be easily understandable and recognizable. That's as much for customers as it is actually for everybody who's working on it as well. Um, so having that focus, you know, a good name brings about focus. Um, but failing all of those things, j- just getting Jason Bates to name it would be sensible. That having named 11FS, Starling and Monzo, just ask him for a name basically is the, is the key. He does have form, doesn't he? And actually, Monzo, I guess, showed us that uh, even if you have to change your name when you weren't quite expecting to have to change your name, it's not necessarily disastrous, is it? Well, he um, he, came, he came up with Mondo, and then he came up with Monzo as well. Like, there's no limit to this man's uh, abilities. It's incredible form. All right, um, I am going to end us there uh, on that section. So we're going to run to a quick break, and we'll be back with you very shortly. <laughs> Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider, Blockchain Insider, 11FS Spotlight, 11FS Explores, Open Mic Night, After Dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. All right, welcome back. Now let's pick up the conversation uh, and look at that all-important launch date and uh, life afterwards. So, Kate, maybe I'll come to you first on this one. Um, we've touched on the point about pivoting, swerving, etc., quite a lot, I guess, in the context of that run-up to launch. When is it kind of too late or is it ever too late? Oh, I mean, I don't know if I've got a definitive answer on this one, but I suppose that I, I think you can always pivot and you can always adapt and change. I think... You probably have to give yourself like some time just like once you've actually shipped some code and you've put something out, you have to give yourself some time just to kind of understand how people are interacting with it. So um, you don't want to pivot like immediately, like seconds after you've launched something. You have to actually give something the chance to live and breathe in the world and to, you know, even if it's not doing great or not quite doing what you were hoping it would do, like just try and understand why and who it is working for and who it's not. So I don't think it's ever too late to pivot but i think sometimes maybe it can be too early to pivot you and what do you reckon no i totally agree i think it's um you know things just take time to bed down behaviors uh sometimes you often you know to the trust bank example you know what's going to work and so you can double down on that and you can scale it but other times where you've got new capabilities coming out and people are like wow i can do this i'm now going to you know do x y and z as well and and so your behaviors change um and i think you know, to, to Naz's earlier points about stuff will go wrong, so don't panic on that. That's a good time to to flesh it through with with, with low systems. I guess you you want to get you know your your back end your your operational start to build out your operational capabilities. So your engineering capability will it will slowly change, right? Your those areas where you're you're starting to get certainty, you can put more more control, more business business as usual around that. But you still need that ability to roll out new features. You still need that ability to. To, to to make changes, updates, whatever it might be, and so the tempo of the teams will change. But I think the underlying capability to roll out new features and and, and updates is 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 the primary thing. I, I think. Um, I mean, I think on that. I mean, you know, product, customer, uh, you know, tech kind of have worked in hand in hand for a really long period of time before real customers have actually seen this. You know, very often, you know, friends and family have been on this thing for. A, a real long period of time. So, so if there's anything, I think you know, if you launch and customers don't care about the thing you've done, you've done it wrong, right? Um, I think the only thing that is maybe outside of your control with regards to that is, you know, no, uh, no product lives as a as an island, right? You you aren't in control of what your competitor set are actually doing in the market. So, uh, actually, you can kind of start to see. And it's been really interesting, you know, with the things that we've we've built around the world, sort of seeing the 
uh, the market respond to those things and therefore, you know, actually the thing that was unique to start with, well, you've got to keep, you can't rest on your laurels, you've got to keep building, you've got to keep moving those things forward. And and as, as Ewan said, really sort of growing that product market fit um, because it, you know, product market fit is talked about like this um, sort of mythical destination but it's not, you know, you can find product market fit and the market can change and then you don't have product market fit. So it's a, it's kind of a constant um, calibration of what the market really needs and, and really what you offer. That's a, that's a super interesting point, right? And I think um, I quite like what you said about growing product market fit as well as sort of finding product market fit, right? I, I think that's a nice way to think of it. And actually, I suppose, comes back to a recurring theme across these two podcasts, which is things aren't necessarily one and done. And I think to Kate Newen's point, we're talking about sort of trusting the process. But David, at what point do you sort of like, you know, you said like if if if, if you've got it into market and it's not landing, people aren't using it or not using it in the way that you thought, at what point do you panic that you actually have missed the mark? Uh, well, thankfully... Never experienced that, so don't know. Um, but definitely, if the um, if the competitive set shifts enough that actually you're not as competitive as you thought you would be, I mean that that's definitely something we have seen in a few geos. Just because, actually, particularly where we're, it would be great if everybody was you know, as slow moving as the incumbents were. But actually, very often the things that you're launching, you're competing with people who are really good at this stuff. You know, you are competing with the the Revoluts and the Monzos and the Starlings of the world, which, you know, they're, they're pretty good at this process in that way. So you've actually got to try and figure out then, well, what's the unique advantage of a bigger organization doing this? And, and really, you know, that's always a, when it comes to different slices of financial services, um, having those logos, having that brand. And, you know, back to the naming thing we were talking about, I mean, in every one of these projects we we have, a big part isn't just the naming part. It's whether we even acknowledge the fact of the parent organization and does that bring real benefit to it? You know, is is uh, Metal powered by NatWest or, or uh, Mox powered by Standard Chartered better than it would be if it was completely in isolation of one another and and f- almost like finding that fit because of that is a is an evolutionary step as well I, I think that's why you've seen you know very often you've seen uh you know things like Marcus stand alone to start with but then you know bring in the the Goldman Sachs brand for for you know greater levels of credibility same with mox you know same with NatWest uh, and and metal it's uh Almost the the evolution of the market drives really what you need to do next. But I think it goes back to that point we were making on a product side of things, though, with uh, with regards to you know the work that Kate and the team do is, you know, really you don't start with what you think is the complete answer. You've got to be you know continually talking to the customer. You've got to be continually creating and prioritizing that backlog because actually the market shifts and therefore so do your priorities as well. I think one of the things I would add here is that, you know, to David's point, I don't think we've seen anything we've built that's gone south, but we've we've been in organiza- worked alongside organizations who are also building another proposition alongside us with a different group of people. And it was fairly clear that you could see those propositions just they, they just weren't taking off. They were probably built in the in a traditional bank way, large, big projects, fairly waterfall based. Uh, you know, a lot of money being spent on on big vendors. Everything's got to be scaled for market, and it then hits, and it just doesn't resonate. Mm. Uh, and and you know, it's it's interesting. I think we've got two or three examples where we can point to where, you know, we have obviously come in and we've done that small startup type thing, and you can see the bank looking at us, going like, "What the hell are these crazy idiots doing?" You know, this is this is not how you how you how you run a bank. But actually, when it when it actually gets live. It gets traction, and then the the old way of doing it is then trying to come along, and they, they just can't compete. And it's it's it, it's interesting. Obviously, we've not been on the inside of those, right? But you you can see it from the outside, and you can just see uh, those those projects just get shut down or, or whatever it might be, and the cost is just horrendous sometimes. I think I think the context for that though, I think is is interesting because I, I think actually what they lose sight of in those examples is for all of the things that we've just been talking about, where you know. Uh, what we're worried about is the market changing and our customers caring about what we're doing. I think those types of projects fail because actually what they're competing with is the incumbent. You know, actually, is it a better tech stack than the incumbent one? Probably. Like, is it slightly better product than it? Sure. But actually, is it significant enough 
better to actually gain traction from a customer perspective? Absolutely not. Uh, and actually, I mean, I think there's a, um, you know, the the market is awash with, you know, fallen examples of that. You know, arguably, if you look at something like Finn, that Chase built, actually that, you know, very early one of those, which was like, you know, it got live and people were like, I mean, this is no different from Chase, really. You know, what's the material benefit of it? And it kind of took them a couple of attempts to do it differently to to get to a different outcome. You know, Bo over here in the UK, exactly the same. I mean, it kind of got to the market and it was like, is this any different from anything else? And I think almost the organization had convinced itself that it was a unique thing, but because they were competing with themselves rather than actually competing with the market. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Sorry, Naz, I think you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I suppose on that last point, you know, are they building anything new or they're just building a new version of what they have? Um just on the on the subject of this of launch and this point about learning, I think you know it's um, it's very easy to succumb to pressures after launch and to lose sight of what you're actually trying to do, which is to get the best product you can before you do your mass launch and go to scale. Uh, and I think it's very easy once you have a launch for it to become uh, a volumes or a numbers game. Uh, and to lose sight of um, of what you're actually trying to achieve, which is not, you know, whether you get to 5,000 customers uh, three months earlier is not going to ultimately make and break your product over a two-to-time-year uh, horizon. But it's very easy to slip into that mentality. You know, either you're a startup with, I don't know, funding or investor issues, or you're an incumbent with senior stakeholder issues, so to speak. Um, but either way, that pressure comes, and it's very, it's very easy, it's very easy to lose track of why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, and so now it's an interesting one, isn't it? So I guess you know we need to fundamentally measure success differently than in that context. But how do you sort of do that, especially in the context of a bigger organization? Because that fundamentally is like a mind shift, isn't it? It's getting people to believe in it sort of longer term. It's getting them to be a lot less reactive. So I guess that's a challenge in and of itself. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, we talked about doing all the work up front before you launch. Like that, that is part of the work up front before you launch, like uh, setting those expectations and trying to get that cultural mind, mind, mindset in. Uh, and I would almost say it's, it's probably almost the most important work stream out of all of them in some ways. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Is I know we touched on this a little bit last time, but the almost the um, fire doors you've got to create between you know the thing you're trying to create and the the incumbent organization it is it is really really important. You know, you your job I I think and you know like I say I ran as the CEO of Metal for was it 19 months of my life? Like I say, mo most of my role there was basically creating the space for the team to do the job that they needed to do and and actually almost protecting them from kind of all of the noise really around that in order to to focus on wh what really mattered most. And and it's interesting. I mean, you, you kind of think in a, and, you know, I've worked in, you know, big corporate banks, the amount of time you I mean, can lose weeks or months being distracted by, you know, things that are really important, but they're not important to deliver the outcome that you're trying to drive for the customer. It's important because of the operations of a business and the way that the businesses work. So, you know, providing that space and creating that opportunity, uh, you find a small group of people can do amazing things if they're, you know, properly focused and and, and properly um, given the space to make it happen. So uh, it is an interesting one, but I do agree with you, Naz. It's, um, you know, getting that um, rules of engagement and the, the expectations of what people will be seeing and when kind of nailed at the beginning, you know, particularly when actually organizations are used to the launch being, well, we're going to start seeing, you know, things on the side of buses or on TV or whatever. You know, it's a, it's a very different approach to, uh, to finding product market fit. But I think the the saying, Kate, though, is like, is it, you know, do something that 
you know, a hundred people love rather than like 10,000 people, you know, think is meh, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, actually, there's tons of different catchphrases, isn't there? But yeah, that's a, I think that's a good one. And actually, if you can focus on that and, you know, really, really making those hundred people happy, you know, the opportunities, the the sort of virality that comes around that as well, it, particularly if you're building it with a community, um, becomes almost a, a force in itself. But I, I love that point about how you think about success, how you measure success and that being different. And that's obviously then we've talked about that in the sort of context of like the, the big organization. Kate, I'm interested in your thoughts around like, how do we measure our success, right? As 11FS, as like a, a build partner, how do, how do we know? Cause we've talked a lot about this being iterative. How do we know when we're satisfied when we've done a job well done? Um, well, I suppose speaking from my personal perspective, like I'm satisfied when I see like, you know, a journey like a digital experience that I think is fundamentally helping customers to accomplish something in a better way than what, to David's point, you know, already exists in the market. Um, you know, a big obviously I know that KPIs, business KPIs are, are crucial and, and really help to kind of keep the business happy and kind of keep everything moving. But I'm I'm really excited when I see like people that we partner with like focusing on sort of client outcome type metrics that they want to be able to track like you know actually are your customers using their overdraft less like are your customers reaching the end of the month with money still left in their accounts more often than not like these types of kind of life outcome metrics I think are also really important and will vary depending on like the precise product or experience that you're designing you know if you're designing like a, a business lending platform, for example, it might be about whether you're actually helping the businesses that you're supporting to for them to grow, not looking at your own metrics, but looking at the metrics of of your customers and are they having wider business growth or wider business success. So it will really vary based on like you know, the product and the experience itself and also you know, the customer base that you're serving. But that's when I'm happy when I see an, a, a, an experience and also when you see partners you know, being brave enough to be confident to have metrics that they don't directly control. Like they can put a product out there and be confident enough in the product itself, but it's going to do something and have an impact in the world. And I think that's pretty cool. No, I love that. I love that tying it back to what you call the life outcome. I think that's exactly right. Let's throw that one out to the room then. Ewan, what are, what are, you, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, 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 I very much agree with what Kate just said. I think, you know, the customer impact is is massive. But for me, it's, it's, it's making a dent in the world. So the customer impact is one part of it. But I also think if we can actually just leave a, a legacy inside the bank, uh, you know, the number of times I've looked at, particularly on the engineering side, often people bank, people inside the bank sort of know what they need to do. But they don't really have the, have the I don't know what the word I want to use, gumption or something like that. They don't have the, the confidence to actually go and do it. So they, they live vicariously through us. And to actually, for me, to actually see the legacy of, of leaving banks, so Metal is a great example. You know, the team we put in place, the team we left behind, you know, they've grown that massively. I think it's it's had an impact on RBS and the way they, they view the world. You know, banking is 1% finished. And actually, this is a way to help move that forward. So it, it is that legacy element of as well, the, the, the customer stuff that Kate talks about, but also the internal, just a shift in the mindset of, of a bank. You know, can you start yeah. moving that behemoth? Yeah, really nice. I def definitely echo, echo that. I mean, I think the the best thing, and, it, and it's lovely to see, you know, longevity of those things. You know, I think there are a lot of, projects that people do as like little side pets of, you know, the things that they want to achieve. But if you can look back like four years later and the business that you built is still going and still succeeding and is, you know, seen as a, uh, and is an example of how to do it right, that gives you a lot of pride. So, but beyond that though, I, I think critical and almost like the thing that I love hearing most from people that we work with is, is that they can't go back into the main organization and work there anymore. Um, and that is a lovely thing to hear. I mean, you know, Ewan's laughing at me here, but we hear that a lot, right? It's like, I can't go back to working in the way that I used to work because fundamentally they've sort of seen the light. Um, and that's that's a lovely feeling because actually when you get that alignment of, you know, uh, product and uh, and design and, and engineering and you get it all working really well together, the the feeling of that is something very different than a, you really have experienced before, and and it does change people, which is is exciting. Yeah, that's really nice. That impact on customers, the impact on the organization, the impact on the people we work with directly when we do this. And Naz, how about you? I was going to say that should be our new strapline: Hire eleven FS, and we'll make your employees no longer want to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific. Um, 
I, 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 I think I would. Um, obviously, in the risk world, there'll be like some very prosaic points, but I would probably pick up the cultural thing that that you and said because um, it is a completely different way of doing things. Uh, and that's not even having a pop at the big banks. You know, they have large books of millions of customers. You can't always um, take a chance with those things, or it feels very difficult to do things differently when you when you've got that. But I would say that mindset and cultural point is probably the biggest thing. Yeah. No, nice. And I think that's been a recurrent theme, right? Like throughout the two shows, that's been something that we've just come back to time and time again. So it feels like a fitting note on which to end. So that does wrap up today's discussion. Um, guys, thank you all so much uh, for joining me. Let's quickly round the virtual room. Where can people uh, find out more about you all? Uh, I guess, aside from just visiting 11 David, let's start with you. Uh, it's always LinkedIn. Find me lurking over there. Lots of uh, interesting content to talk about. Uh, happy to connect to anybody who wants to connect. Awesome. Ewan? Uh, I want to go LinkedIn as I always do, but if someone wants to drop me an email, ewan at 11 com. Excellent. Kate? Yeah, also also on LinkedIn. Um, you can email me kate at 11 com. I am, on, I am on Twitter as well. I've got out the habit of using it recently, but I'm going to re-engage. So um, K8 Moody. Excellent. And Naz? Uh... Oh, I live in the 18th century, so I'd say email for me, uh, nasrs11fs.com. Awesome. All right. And you can find me very much in the 21st century at Ross Gallagher 7 on Twitter. Um, okay. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you've heard, please do subscribe to our podcast. Let us know what you think of these deep dives into our work. Um, if you like them, uh, we'll make some more. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media just search for 11fs or fintech insider or email podcast at 11fs.com thank you very much and goodbye